The following podcast is brought to you by Pro Wrestling Connect, Australia's newest choice for event management and brand development specialising in pro wrestling. And now, now, the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. Watch Watch global. global. Support local. local. It's the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. The move. Hello, and welcome to the Wrestling Landscape Podcast. I am your host, Lance Larson, and the Wrestling Landscape is the casual wrestling podcast, the informal wrestling podcast and on today's episode i am drinking water because i have two pots of coffee in me so i don't need any more caffeine and it is far too early in the day to have any alcohol so water it is if i had some lemonade i'd probably have that it's no lemonade in the home so today we are talking all CMLL and AAA on my previous Lucha episode. Earlier, just talked about the Lucha Indies. Today we're talking about the big two in the world of Lucha Libre. And I had fallen behind both CMLL and AAA. So what happened was I just went back throughout the week and pick and chose the matches I wanted to watch. And goddamn, if that wasn't the greatest thing ever... Because when you're just looking at a card and you're like, oh, I'll watch these two matches or I'll watch those three matches, you end up liking every match you watch. And it's like, god damn, this is great. So there was not a single card that I watched top to bottom this week from CMLL or AAA. However, I did pick and choose my matches and it was so much fun. So any top to bottom company wide Opinions I don't really have, because I just chose the matches I wanted to, and I really enjoyed it. So let's jump right in. Let's jump right in. CMLL, Viernes Spectacular, from Friday, July the 5th. I watched a match with Lampago from Atlantis Jr. versus Io de Viano Tercero. For those of you that don't know, their fathers, Atlantis and Viano Tercero, had a all-time classic match. Sorry, my cat attacked me there. Anyway, we were talking about Atlantis and Viano Tercero. So they had a classic 19 years ago in March of the year 2000. One of the greatest Lucha Libre matches of all time. Possibly the best Lucha Libre match I have ever seen, which ultimately isn't saying that much. I've really only started watching Lucha in the last couple of years, so my opinion on that doesn't mean a ton. But CMLL does think enough of that feud that they are trying to recreate it with their sons, as reported by Meltzer and others. So, we got a one-on-one match between them in a match with Lampago, which is a one-fall 10-minute time limit match. Uh, This one ended in a no contest because after several minutes, probably eight or nine minutes, of good work, entertaining work, the crowd getting into it, uh, the ref called... At first, I thought it was a DQ because they were going after matches, each other's masks, but Io Daviano Tessero had shoved the ref on the outside And when the ref finally got back in the ring, they were going after each other's masks. And so the ref's just like, fuck it, throwing this match out. He normally, when there is a DQ, they raise someone's hand. There was no hand raised. So I'm going with no contest as opposed to DQ. But the match was enjoyable. What was going on? Good work. The crowd enjoyed it, which ultimately is what matters. And obviously they're protecting the finish for later on. Now... I'm sure these two will cross paths a million times in the next 20 years. Atlantis Jr., however, is very new in his career. 
He just debuted as Atlantis Jr. in January. It's only July. I don't know if it's too soon to start going after this feud. Like, maybe he could have had a few years under his belt before he started crossing paths with um, Io de Viano Chisero. We'll see. I also don't know how long Atlantis has. So maybe they wanted to make sure his dad was there when this started because they were teaming up together against some Vianos earlier in the year. So, I don't know. We'll see. I also don't know how old Io de Viano Cicero is. We'll see how long this goes on. We'll see if, you know, this is a quick blow off, you know, like a year and a half from now. Or if this is a fucking 10 year feud in the making. Either way, good match. I like both these workers. I look forward to seeing both of them again. Next on the Friday night show. I guess I shouldn't say next. The next match I watched. It was NGD, New Generation, Dinamites, defeating Teton, Triton, and Esfinge to retain the Mexican National Trios titles. This was a hell of a goddamn fucking match. Lots and lots of good work. Very, very tight and smooth. Um, there were a couple bad spots. Not a ton. Most of the work was very, very good. And I really enjoyed it. NGDs are fucking fantastic. In every possible way. Their psychology, their work, the way their matches are laid out. They're fucking great. I fucking love them. This match played with a lot of lucha tropes. So, like, they do a Tower of Doom, and then someone springboards in, and the person that took the Tower of Doom, they, you know, splash them, 450 them, and they go for the pin, and everyone kicks out. This time, the person that ate the Tower of Doom countered and started pinning the other guy, and so we had a triple pin of the Rudos on the Technicos. Never seen that before. Sure, it has happened before. I'd never seen it before. Thought that was great. Um, also, when the Technicos were going for the triple dive, the Rudos cut them off to the triple dive of their own. Rudos went for it again. The Technicos cut them off into the triple dive of their own. Which was so much better than just the Technicos doing it from the get-go. Played with a lot of things like that. I really, really enjoyed it. So it's one of those things where it's like, because I'm newer to Lucha Libre, it took me a while to get like the feel of the motifs, the motifs, I'm sorry, and the tropes, and what usually happens in a Lucha match. But now that I've got some of those under my belt, I see this match, and I see how they were toying with expectations in it, and I'm like, fuck, this was so smartly laid out. So I really enjoyed this trios match. This was my kind of match. But Dinamites retain. <coughs> Next, on matches that hit YouTube on Saturday, July 6th, but they were taped on July the 2nd. It was a CMLL show in Guadalajara. Just two matches here. And neither of these matches were spectacular. Like the first match I'm going to talk about, I'd probably give three and a half. The second match, I'd probably give a three flat. But there was so much fucking heat in these matches that they just felt so special. Even though the work itself was, you know, fine. <laughs> you know, three and three and a half stars. You know, it's, it's fine. It's good. It didn't suck. But it's just like the heat in this building was so fucking great. It was Soberano Jr., Valiente, and Mystico defeating NGD, New Generation Dinamites. Hot as fuck. Really fun match. Good work. Everyone knew exactly what to do and what not to do to get heat and maintain heat in this match. Crowd was making noise throughout the entire thing in this packed building in Guadalajara. It was great. This was so much fun to watch. So, nothing, like, spectacular out of the world in terms of a Lucha Libre Trios match. It was just, you know, it was a solid Lucha Trios match. But in front of this crowd, it felt so fucking great. Really, really enjoyed it. As I'll probably be watching more CMLL tape from Guadalajara that hits. Not a lot of it hits, not all of it hits, but some of it does. Probably going to keep an eye on more of it if the crowd's going to be like this every time. Then in the main event of that show... We had Diablo Roja defeating Gran Guerrero. Again, this was a fine match. Probably not even quite as good as the trios match before it. But the heat! People are losing their fucking minds over the shit. Gran Guerrero being a brilliant heel, drawing as much heat as possible. Good God. And another thing about Gran Guerrero, 
and Ultimo and like Los Guerreros in general, it seems like whenever they have a big time singles match, the go home stretch always revolves around top rope spots between both competitors. And I feel like it just slows down the third act so much that like I lose, I don't know, like I start getting disconnected from it. So, whatever. This crowd obviously got over huge in the building. So, me critiquing it probably means nothing. Me critiquing Los Guerreros finishes and go-home stretches means absolutely nothing. Because they're a big money draw in the business. At least in Mexico. So. In my opinions mean jack squat on that. Because they do what they need to do to draw tickets. And if some wrestling nerd in the middle of the United States of America isn't a fan of it, it doesn't mean shit. So... It draws money, it draws heat, that's what matters, so good for them. Next, on a match which hit YouTube on Sunday, July the 7th, although it was taped on, or I'm sorry, Monday, July 7th, although it was taped on, oh no, the 7th was a Sunday. Doesn't matter, it hit July 7th, but it was taped on June 30th, it was Kawato defeating Aodaz to win the super lightweight title. This match was very, very good. It built so well and so smartly. The first fall, which had a decent amount of time, by the way, was almost all technical wrestling. And it was a ton of fun, especially if you like that kind of thing. And Kawada got the first fall. But it's just like, and they set up the whole fall with just technical wrestling like that. So it was so easy to build off that for the second and third falls. The second fall was very, very quick. Because they were very flashy. Our dogs got the roll-up for the pin. So now it's 2-2. And we're going into this third fall. And they've only done so much in between the ropes. That like any kind of big moves they do in the third act are going to get over huge. Because of the baseline they set in the first two acts. Like it was so smartly laid out. And like, and this third act was so good. You know, it hooked me in. Like I was so into this third act, into this third fall. It was great. Very, very dramatic. Lots of near falls. They built it well. Saved all of their big stuff for later on. It got over big. Especially with me. Good work. Good psychology. Thumbs up from me. I know Kawada has gotten a lot of shit for his work in Mexico. I haven't heard about that in a long time. So I think people are recognizing what's happening with Kawada. That he doesn't suck. That he is good. And that he's finally getting the fucking hang of wrestling in CMLL. Because this was a damn good match. Now, he had a good dance partner. Ardaz is very, very good. But this was a very, very good match. And it was lengthy, too. It was close to 20 minutes. So, good for these two. Good title win for Kawato. We'll see what that means. Because titles really only mean so much in CMLO. But champions usually have them for a long time. And we'll see whenever Kawato gets called back from excursion. So I don't know if this means that it's not happening in the next couple months. I don't know if he's just going to fucking drop that belt in two weeks. We'll see. But great match to win it. On Monday, the Arena Puebla show. In Puebla, July the 8th. This obviously hit same day. The Friday... Monday and Tuesday shows are aired live on YouTube. They hit same day, so. Those are the two shows that hit over the weekend that were taped from the last week or two um, that I covered. Uh, in this match, we had a Dragon Lee, Soberano Jr., and Mystico defeating Euphoria, Negro Casas, and Gran Guerrero. This was a good match. Again, it built nicely. You know, you hear these six names, and obviously they're all good wrestlers. There's no way this match is going to suck. There's no way its composition is going to suck. But the third fall was Negro Casas hitting a low, bro, low blow. So the Rudos were disqualified, which felt flat. Like, thank God this wasn't the main event because it would have felt even flatter. But it was just like, you have a good little match with these six good workers and just ends in a low blow. So I can only assume that would mean some kind of rematch later. Um, a lot of times, the Puebla storylines stay in Puebla. So don't really expect this to affect any Arena Mexico stuff. It'll probably just affect Puebla. I hope they do a rematch, because if, if this is just it, and oh, this is just how the match ended, 
and they just move on from it, that'll be kind of dumb. But I would not put that past a CMLO. So the work was fine, the finish was flat, but it was nothing special. And so with these six names, I obviously expected a good match. But because it was a Monday show in Puebla, I probably shouldn't have had as high expectations as I did. Because Puebla, like Monday and Tuesday in general, but Puebla in particular, you just... It just kind of feels like it's a B-day for them. And they take that to heart in their work. Not that this match sucked. It didn't. It was fine. It was good. But if these six had a match in Arena Mexico on a Friday in the semi-main, I can guarantee you it would have had a little more thought into it. And obviously a much better finish. So that was the one match from Puebla I saw. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. This month we are sponsored by Grapple, a fantastic new wrestling app available on iOS and Google Play completely for free where you can rate all the matches that you watch in WWE, Impact Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, all across the world. And we are even getting Australian wrestling involved in the Grapple app rating system as well, starting with PWA Pro Wrestling Australia. Uh, their Green Label event from the other week is up there. The Black Label event, All Eyes on Troy, is up there. And the last two years of events, at least, are up on Grapple right now for you to rate so that people can get around our Aussie wrestling and see that we are just as good as anywhere else in the world. Basically, Grapple is a Rotten Tomatoes for wrestling. Now we all get a say. It is the democratization of match rating systems for pro wrestling. It's amazing. So uh, I get a say. You get a say. Uh, you can follow me on there. At Greg Unchained, you can follow uh, Big Boy Mikey at B plus underscore Big Boy. At Mr. Mysterious is on there. At Danders is on there. At Jay is on there. We're all on there rating the matches that we watch. Uh, so follow us. We'll follow you back. Let's build this community and get uh, as many Australian wrestling fans onto the Grapple app as we can. You can download it right now. It has over 30,000 matches on there going back to 1985. 15 promotions around the world. There's so much to do on the Grapple app. It's a great little community, so get around it. It's grapple, G-R-A-P-P-L dot C-O, and uh, it's for free on, on App Store and Google Play. Get around it. Hey, everyone. Just want to take a second to tell you about one of our new sponsors, Outbreak Nutrition. Outbreak Nutrition are creating supplements for survival, sharper minds, quicker reflexes, all the energy you need to take your performance to the next level, whether that, that be on the field, in the gym, on the gaming field, that's right, they have specifically designed gaming supplements as well to help you focus on those late night sessions. They even sell coffee, you guys, at Outbreak Nutrition. You can get coffee pods, you can get coffee beans, you can get supplements for the bedroom as well if you want to enhance your performance there. These are performance enhancing supplements for every aspect of your life, specifically designed by gamers for gamers to stay fit and healthy in the gym, to stay sharp and focused on the game and to dominate in all areas of life. So check out OutbreakNutrition.com, and for being a listener of our podcast, they will give you 10% off your order when you enter the code B+. That is B-P-L-U-S at checkout. So make sure if you want to stay on top of your game, if you want to take your performance to the next level, OutbreakNutrition.com, enter the code B+, at checkout. Hey guys, just a reminder, if you want to hear all of these wonderful B-plus podcast episodes completely ad-free, make sure you head over to Patreon or Podbean, where we are the featured podcast this week. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month, up to $10 a month, where anything you want to help us with, it really helps out. It's going to help us grow the site. It's going to help us redesign some things. And everything that we get through this and through the advertising as well is all going straight back into the podcast so that we can get Aussie Graps out there for the rest of the world to hear about, for the rest of the world to see, so we can grow this mission of watch global, support local, and build indie wrestling. So if you want to be a part of that and get some really cool rewards like call-in shows, bonus episodes, ad-free like I mentioned, then head over to patreon.com slash the B plus and subscribe today. I watched two matches from CMLL's Tuesday show, their Marte show, from Marina, Mexico, on July the 9th. Um, I, I did like every match I watched, by the way. I do want to make that clear. Any kind of critiques I put out did not override my enjoyment for it. I liked every match I watched. Mostly because I handpicked them from looking at the cards. As I said a million times, because I want to do this every week, because it makes me enjoy every single match I watch. 
But I know that's not really observing what's going on with the company or with the business, that you need to watch whole cards, whole shows, and follow companies to the good feel for them, and you can't just pick and choose what you like if you're covering it. Now, if you're just watching for enjoyment's sake, and you don't have a podcast to record on it, you can just pick and choose what you want. Enjoy the fuck out of it. But I'm trying to observe the business, trying to understand the business, and relate that information to my listeners. So I will not do that every week. So that's, a, that's not a smart way to understand the business. Anyway, two matches from the Marte show. We had Euphoria, Templario, and Gran Guerrero defeating Flyer, Volador Jr., and Caristico. Awesome match. Tons of action. Work was smooth. Everyone was great. You hear their six names are on a semi-main event of a show in Arena Mexico, even if it is a Tuesday, and you're like, that'll be a fun match. And it was. It wasn't some kind of fucking classic. It wasn't four and a quarter. But goddamn, I don't know, three and three quarters? Just a real solid match. A really good match. Tons of fun Lucha spots. If you like Lucha six-man spots, or I'm sorry, Lucha six-man matches, you would like this match. Just real solid, lots of fun. But nothing special. In the main event of that Tuesday show, we had Dragon Lee defeating Barbaro Cavanario. Mano a mano was excellent. Again, this match built well, which made the third fall feel really, really special and dramatic. Tons of near falls in the third fall. Both guys were great, as you would come to expect. And they were very smart in the way they worked their Rudo Technico dynamic. Cavernario was a very good Rudo here. Drew Heat. Dragon Lee was definitely the baby face. And the way they worked reflected that. Barbaro was more of a bully. And Dragon Lee was definitely doing a little bit more flashy stuff. And it worked great. Not that Barbaro didn't have his high spots. But it was worked smartly. And again, they saved a lot of their big stuff for the third act. Made it feel really special. It worked so, so well. Excellent match. Above average match. Especially for CMLL. So good on those guys. Two of the best guys in the company. And two of the best guys in Mexico. And the world of Lucha Libre as a whole. If I'm being honest. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about it and it's like, no, I stand by that statement. More... One-on-one -on -one matches in the main event, please, CMLL. You have lots of talent. And because they mix it up so often in six-man tags, the one-on-one -on -one matches feel special. And a lot of them are, are protected, too. I know, obviously, you save some for anniversary main events and semi-main events. Or dos leyendas, semi-mains and mains. But there's some you can use as main events on Arena Mexico shows throughout the year. Like this one. It was great. I, I really hope they would do that more often. I don't think they will. But, as always, time will tell. So, from the matches I picked and chose, excellent week from CMLL. Really enjoyed that shit. Like, honestly, I don't think... There wasn't a single match I disliked. And probably the one I disliked the most was Niebla Roja over Gran Guerrero in Guadalajara. And, like, even that was fine. And it had tons of heat, you know, so I'm sucked in anyway. Maybe my second least favorite would be the Pueblo one. The Dragon Lee, Sobrano Jr., and Mystico over Euphoria, Gran Guerrero, and Negro Casas. And really, that was just more because of the finish. And even if that had a clean finish, it still would have been, you know, right around where the Niebla Roja Gran Guerrero one was. Just around three stars. Fine match. Mm. Good matches this week for CMLL. Anyway. Moving on to Triple A. They had uh, two shows this week, which Triple A is so hit and miss that the Cubs fan slash Lucha Blog has an own Twitter account dedicated to when Triple A's next show is because they are so irregular. So I follow that. Otherwise, I would have no fucking idea when Triple A's next show was. So they had two shows this week. Sometimes they go weeks without shows. And then other times like this, they have two shows in one week. Sometimes they have shows back to back days. It's bizarre. But on the first show from Wednesday, July the 3rd, I watched three matches from that show, and I fucking loved all of them. We had Drago retaining his Latin American title 
over Cheek Tormenta and Golden Magic in a triple threat match. This was an awesome match with a shit ton of action. And as you will hear me talk about in every triple threat match or triangle match or three-way match, whatever the fuck you want to call it, I'm so fucking glad that they had really, really smart three-person spots. This was not WWE where they did 30 seconds of three-person spots and then they throw a motherfucker out of the ring and they do one-on-one and then they trade turns, okay? For 80% of this match, all three competitors were involved with each other. And it was fucking awesome. They were so smart about it, and they still have kick-ass spots. I loved the fuck out of this match. And Sheik Tormenta, I have been underselling the entire time I've been watching AAA. She is fucking good. She is a damn good wrestler. And I'd love to see her get some shine in AEW, too, if that opportunity should arise. Because I watched her on this and the 7-6 show that we're going to talk about next, and she fucking shined. She was very, very good in this match. Now, she did have two good dancing partners, but she definitely pulled her own weight in this. She was not carried in the slightest. I always thought she was a fine wrestler. Wouldn't, like, stop me from watching a match because she was in it, but it wouldn't, like, oh, Cheek Tormenta, I gotta watch this match. But now I'm there with Cheek Tormenta. She's very, very good. Uh, Drago and Golden Magic obviously did their share. Golden Magic is very, very good. Big fan of his. And again, the three man sparks were very, very smart. And really, the only time that there weren't three people in it was when they attacked Cheek Tormenta on the outside, and then Drago and Golden Magic got in the ring for the go-home stretch, and just the two of them finished. So it made sense, and it all worked out. Drago retained. Afterwards, a Daga. Dag- Daga? Daga? It's Daga, right? I'm going to keep saying Daga. Pissa Blanchard's boyfriend. Attacked Drago afterwards. And uh, to set up a uh, title match for them on the July 6th show coming up. And so next, Daga had a match teaming with Keira, where they defeated Puma King and Starfire. Again, good match, built well, lots of good action, a lot of good work. Except for there were some sloppy spots where, I don't know if the timing was off or they misjudged the distance between each other. But there were just a couple of moves that did not land the way they were supposed to. And one really bad botch, where Daga was bent over in front of the turnbuckle, and Starfire, I don't know what she was doing, but she jumped from the top rope, and it was like, her knees landed on his back. So I thought, you know, she was going for, like, maybe, like, a reverse Meteora or some shit, or, like, double knees to the back or whatever, but that is not what happened. I don't know what they were going for. I don't know who messed up, but it was a botch, and it was bad. So that was, like, the only true botch of the match, but there were some spots that were like, oh, that... That did not go as planned. So, some sloppiness, but overall good match. Daga used some brass knucks in the middle of it, and then used them again for the finish, so he got the win. As he was challenging for the title on the next show, it made sense for him to get the pin. After the match, uh, Drago came out and attacked Daga to further cement that title match and to build it up more, so that was set and good to go with logical booking heading into it. Um, I do want to comment on how fucking good Kayra is. Like, she didn't shine as much in this match as she has in previous AAA matches, but every time I see her, she's smooth as fuck, she's creative as fuck, and I would also like to see her in AEW. God damn. Kayra, I think, is my favorite luchadora at the moment. And I don't think it's close. Because Shawnee, Lady Shawnee, Lady Maravilla, Starfire. All my favorite luchadors are AAA folks. That should be a surprise. But yeah, Kara's Kara's the top dog for me in that category. Next, the third and last match I watched on the July 3rd show was the OGTs. Defeating Io de Vaquino, Laredo Kid, and Mrs. Jr. Holy fuck, was this a goddamn good match. Jesus fucking Christ on the cross. So, for those of you that follow AAA and know who these folks are, the Kinyo, Laredo Kid, and Mrs. Jr. are very flashy, very acrobatic baby faces that do a lot of cool high spots and moves. The OGTs are larger fellows who are as not as athletic as the babyface counterparts, but they are really good bases. And so they worked really well as heels and the perfect foil for these smaller, quicker Technicos. And so these two teams blended perfectly. 
because the Rudos could be bases for the Technicos doing their cool, awesome spots. And then the heat came and the Rudos looked super believable because they're so much bigger than the baby faces pounding on them. The only thing that did not make sense about this match is, was why the ref did not disqualify the Rudos for using all of the weapons they used. But it's AAA, so that's the kind of thing you can't critique. But this match was perfect in the heel baby face dynamic. And it let everyone shine according to their strengths. And it was awesome. The first act was great. The heat was better than usual. And the third act comeback by the baby faces was awesome. The Rudos did get the pin. But it almost didn't even matter. Because this match was so great from start to bottom. Absolutely loved it. Um, the work was again mostly good. A couple of sloppy spots. But really nothing too serious. Just an overall kick-ass match. So much fun. The psych made sense. The moves were awesome. Io Del Vaquino is a fucking god. Io Del Vaquino is going to be for AEW in 2020 what Rey Mysterio Jr. was for WCW in 1997. I stand by that statement. He is that fucking good. So on their tapings on July the 6th, uh, I only watched two matches from the show. And it was, again, Io Del Vaquino, Laredo Kid, and Mrs. Jr. teaming up. They are the trios tag camps, by the way. And they ate a loss in a straight-up trios match in the previous taping. But not against a team they're facing at Triple Mania. So, I don't know if that's setting up a trios tag match, title match, down the road. It's Triple A. Booking is not their strong point. Which usually annoys me, but let's I I watch AAA for the cool action, like, and that's just about it. That is my draw for AAA. It's not everyone's draw for AAA, obviously. I am not their target audience, but that's that's why I watch AAA. Um, we had, like I said, Vikingo Laredo Kid and Mrs. Junior teaming up against Cheek Tormenta, who again demonstrated how fucking good she is. Eterno and La Parca Negra, so. Again, Vaquino is a fucking god. This man can do no wrong. His balance is unheard of. He's as creative as fuck. He's amazing. That's all I have to say. Chick Tormenta is underrated. Um, I really want this Technico trio of Vaquino, Laredo Kid, and Mrs. Jr. in AEW. Because AEW's already done, you know, a good amount of six-man tags. And so they're obviously going to be fine using a lot of six-man tags. So they should bring up the six-man team because they are fucking insane. Like, think about these guys against Stronghearts. Or SCU. Or three folks from OWE that aren't Stronghearts. Like Mr. T-Cool. Or A-Ben. Fuck. Lots of big bumps. Built well. Um, peaked right towards the finish. So the go-home stretch made sense. Vikingo gets the pin, which I'm always happy about because he deserves as much a push as possible. Even though, you know, he'll never be the top guy in AAA. It's just, it's just not how it works, sadly. Um, Cheek Tormenta did a brain buster from the apron to the outside. She was holding her head pretty bad afterwards. I hope it was just selling and that she is okay. I have not heard any news either way. So in this, in something like this, you always assume no news is good news. Because if she was seriously hurt, something would have eked out through the wrestling media, I would assume. And then in the last match I watched from AAA this week, it was Drago retaining his Latin American title over Daga via DQ. Which I normally would not be a fan of at all in a title match. However... What it was, was Daga using his brass knucks again, like he used the preview, you know, the three nights before. So he used it throughout this match too, and he went to go use it for the finish, but this time he got disqualified. So, the story made sense, and the crowd loved it. So, as much as this is something that I would typically shit on, I feel like I can't, because it made sense with what had happened previously, and the crowd popped for it. So it's like, what would I be shitting on? They were working to the crowd, and it worked! If it works, it works. 
So I feel like that's all I can say on that finish. But the work was pretty good. That I can comment on. I enjoyed the work. The heat was a little slow again. I feel like Daga has some problems with that. Where the middle of his heat tends to just be a little boring. You know, just walks around the ring. Does a kick. Walks around the ring. Points to the crowd. Says something. Locks in a chin lock for longer than he needs to. So. But other than that, I really enjoyed this match. The work was good. And Draco is still your champion. Now... I don't know if this is the end of the feud. It would make sense to me for them to have some kind of blow off down the road. Maybe some kind of no DQ match or something like that. But we will see. Again, booking is not AAA's strong point. So on a certain level, I'm just glad that they told that connective story of Daga using the brass knucks. Because I felt like it worked. The crowd certainly liked it. So that was my thoughts on my hand-picked matches from CMLL and AAA this week. Hopefully next week I will be back to my regular Lucha coverage. Um, I know this week I had two different Lucha episodes. That was just for various reasons. Next week that shouldn't happen because there's no AAA show. So there's no reason why I can't cover the IWRG show or at least the top three matches and CNL, WWL, and CML Viernes. So there's no reason why I can't watch all that and review it on the episode. So expect that next week. Anyways, this has been the Wrestling Landscape Podcast covering this week in GML and Triple H. Thank you so much for listening and take care.